Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 16. Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia and he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, Paul goes through and he lists a lot of the, the indicators, a lot of the acts of someone who is following the flesh. All right? Now, this is not an all-inclusive list. I bet you some of you have invented things that are not on this list. Okay? This is just an exemplary list. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. That means you can see them. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Okay? So we have two lists that Paul is presenting to us. Both of these are exemplary lists, not inclusive lists. They're, they're not exhaustive, meaning that there are other things that can go in each list. But these are things that you can look and tell by the way a person is living their life. Are they living a life sealed to God by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, or are they living a life that is led by their flesh? Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. There are people who do not know God that can show some of these fruits. Okay? But the course of their life will indicate which they are following. Now, there are people that are in the church, that are in Christ, that are sealed, that still exhibit some of these works of the flesh. Um, fits of anger. I don't know who that describes. <laughs> The idea here is that you have a choice every moment of every day what you will do. Okay? If you are not sealed to Christ, you don't really have a choice. But if you are sealed unto Christ, you have a choice laid before you every moment of every day what path you're going to walk. Are you going to do the things that come natural to you, the things that you've learned over the course of your life, things taught to you, and stumble and fall and bumble your way through this life? Or are you going to choose to live your life led by God's Spirit such that the fruit of His Spirit is exhibited in your life? So, so first, whose fruit is it? It's God's Spirit's fruit living inside of you. So God's the one that causes this to be birthed in you. Okay? You, you understand that? It's not like the pressure's on you to all of a sudden exhibit patience. You might have to be patient while you wait for patience. You can laugh, that's okay. God is birthing in you each of these fruits. Now, keep in mind, we always say increasingly, not perfectly. Okay? What we mean by that is none of us is going to get all of these perfectly all the time. I'm waiting to get one of them perfect once. We are increasing in measure. We should be able to look back over the course of our life and see that where we are now is further than where we were. Last week, last month, last year, last decade. Okay? So these are the fruit of the Spirit, God births these in us. We have to choose to work cooperatively with His Spirit. And I knew I was going to be talking about this this week because I was so bad at it. 
So many times this week, I have to pray, God, help me right now, this moment, to live a life led by your Spirit, sealed by your Spirit, that bears your Spirit's fruit. And I would sing the little song that I learned when I was a kid. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Over and over and over again. Okay? Now, you do it how you want. Don't judge me. Right? But I found that as I would sing that song, whatever was pressing in on me at the moment would start to ease off. Now, 4 o'clock this morning, I woke up. How many of you were awake at 4? You should have called me. You could have talked. You probably wouldn't have wanted to talk to me. I woke up and I was in a bad mood. Absolutely no reason whatsoever. Christy was on her side of the bed. Oh, she should be over here snuggling me. <laughs> what is she doing on her side of the bed? And about the time I had that thought, she rolled over. And she started snuggling me. What, what is she doing? Get off! Don't you know it's hot? Get on your own side! Talk! Okay, it didn't take me very long to figure out what was going on. And I started praying. Okay, God. I see. This is another moment, another opportunity for me to choose to, to bear the fruit of your spirit. And I started singing that song. And I sang that song almost nonstop for about an hour and a half. Yeah, it was pretty monotonous. Okay? But I had to choose how I was going to act. God, am I going to let you do this in me? Or am I going to do it my own way? Am I going to stumble? Am I going to fall? Am I going to blow this? God, please don't let me blow this. I've blown this so many times, and I know doing it my way fails every time. And I still choose to do it my way sometimes. God, help me. Help me. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. So, we have been working through the list of the fruits of the Spirit. What does this mean? What does this look like? Uh, would you go ahead and put the definitions up? Wow, he's awesome. <laughs> So, we've worked through love, this is unconditional, generated because the giver has chosen to love, not because of anything the receiver has done. This is the love that God has for us. God chooses to love us. It's a part of his nature. We can only learn to love like this because he loves us this way. Okay? You can't do this of yourself. Now, we get a small picture of this if you have children, the love that you have for your children. But even that is somewhat faulty because we don't love perfectly. So, love. Joy. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Far surpassing happiness because it is based on who He is, not what we are going through. So, we get so confused sometimes and we, we react to what's going on around us. When things are well, we have joy. When things are not so well, not so much joy. That's not what God is calling us to. He is calling us to have joy because we know Him. We have relationship with Him. What, what can the world do to take that away? Absolutely nothing. Things may get horribly bad in your life. Awful, terrible. But you still have relationship with with the Almighty God, the loving Father, who loved you and sent His Son to give His life up for you, that you might have relationship with Him. That is something to take joy in. Peace. This is something the world cannot give, and it does not understand. The world doesn't even get this. Okay? The world can't give it to you, we have the perfect example of this, of Jesus sleeping in the stern of the boat in the midst of the storm. I mean, the storm is raging. The disciples are panicking. They're worrying. We're going to die. Jesus, wake up. And he gets up and he's... He, okay. Jesus woke up then kind of like I wake up sometimes. What is your problem? <laughs> All right, hey, wind, wave, knock it off. What is wrong with you? And he calmed the storm. But see, Jesus was asleep in the storm. He wasn't worried. He wasn't stressed. There was nothing going on but what God was allowing. And he had full and complete confidence in God. That's the peace that we have. 
Okay? Patience. This is having the ability to avenge yourself, but refraining from doing so. Okay? Having the ability to avenge yourself, to defend yourself, but refraining, holding back, not doing it. Being patient with one another. <coughs> Being patient with others outside of your realm of cronies. We find it easier to be patient with people that agree with us, don't we? But what about the people that don't agree with us? Are we patient with them? Or we just throw our hands up in exasperation? Being patient. Kindness. It is the grace that pervades the whole nature, mellowing all which would have been harsh and austere. Okay? This is something that is who you are. Okay? Kind. This is Jesus. Now, think for a moment. Was, was Jesus kind when he cleaned out the temple? Was Jesus being kind when he rebuked Peter? Yeah, he was being kind. And, and we'll get to why in a moment. Kindness is who you are. Goodness is character energized, expressing itself in active goodness. Goodness means you're doing something. Kindness is who you are. Goodness is what you do. Okay? So, if you know the scripture as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Kindness is innocent as doves. Goodness is as shrewd as serpent and as innocent as doves. You need the both. Okay? It's not enough to just be as shrewd as a serpent. You need to be as innocent as a dove. That's what the two of these work together to accomplish. Faithfulness, the characteristic of a person who is reliable, sincere. Can people trust you? Are you going to be there for them when things get rough, or are you only going to be there when things are good? Are you a fair weather friend? What about in your workplace? Can they trust you? What about with the things they tell you? Can they trust that you're not going to run and blab? Being faithful. Gentleness, meekness. I put meekness up there. Because I use gentleness in the description. I realized up there I did goodness too. Deal with it. <laughs> Have patience with me. <clears throat> gentleness, meekness, a condition of mind and heart which demonstrates gentleness, not in weakness, but in power. Now, the reason we put meekness up there is because a word directly translated, the closest we have in English is meekness. A lot of the, the translations that you guys are reading will not use that word because over time, the meaning of that word has changed. Okay? Meekness means restrained power, not weakness. We have this idea that if someone is meek, they're weak. They can't do something to defend themselves. That's not meekness. Meekness, you can defend yourself. Oh, yeah. But you choose not to. Okay? Okay? This is the way of life. This is intent. Okay? So up there in kindness, we have what you are. Goodness is how you act. Gentleness is your intent. How you intend to do things. And that brings us to self-control. We're going to be talking about self-control today. You guys probably never thought this day would come, did you? <laughs> I can make it last longer, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> the Greek word for self-control, for those of you that care, is ingratia. Okay? It, it comes from two words that are, that are stuck together. It's a compound word. En, en meaning in. Ingrate, which is... Um, it, the essence of it is, is strength. Okay? In strength. Now, Vincent's word studies of the New Testament says it means holding in hand the passions and desires. 
Okay? From this word, we come up with temperate, self-controlled, continence, temperance, and self-control. I just stuck that one in twice because I didn't realize it was there the first time. Being able to restrain yourself. Now, we oftentimes think that self-control means you're restraining yourself from doing something that you probably shouldn't do. I probably should not honk at that guy that just cut me off. I probably shouldn't drive around in front of him and go 25. Okay, that's part of self-control. That's part of it. Not doing what you shouldn't do. Holding yourself back from doing those things that you should not do. But the other part of it is that we really don't look at very often is doing the things you should. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Disciplining yourself. Making a point to set aside time first thing in the morning to spend time with God. Oh, but my mornings are so busy. Get up earlier. But you don't know how late I go to bed. Go to bed earlier. Discipline yourself. Discipline yourself to do those things which you should do. Last summer, God spoke to Christy and I and, and told us that we needed to be spending a half hour in prayer on our own and then a half hour in prayer together. Well, God, I don't have that much to say. Half hour? Okay. So what I did is I took the church roster and I wrote by each name things that I knew were going on in your lives. And if I didn't know something specifically was going on in your life, I just wrote blessings. And so I would go out and I would start my, my prayer. And I, I don't know what you guys do. I tend to do my prayer after the model prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven hallowed be your name. And giving honor to God first. And I, I kind of follow that process. And then when I got done and I realized that I still had 28 and a half minutes left, I, I pray fast. I start going through the list and praying for people in the church. And then when Christy and I got together, we would pray together and, and we'd pray for things that God had laid on our heart and things and then we would go through the list. Now, I don't know what God has done, but my half hour time alone has, has expanded to sometimes an hour, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. And, and this mo I have no idea what happened this morning because I got up in plenty of time to pray and I, I was praying and I, and I thought, okay, I, I probably should check because I probably got about 20 minutes or so before we have to leave. I, I need to check. <laughs> I only got five minutes till we have to leave. God, what happened to the time? Time change. I didn't realize it worked that way. But I had to discipline myself to pray. I have to determine, okay, what time do I have to be to the first place? What time do I have to be up? Okay, I'm going to take away from that time an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half. That way I can get up, I can do... My stuff in the morning, wash my face, brush my teeth, put clothes on, I can make Christie's coffee, I can get that all set up and I can go and spend my time in prayer and in the Word and I can spend time with Christy in prayer and then I can do my day. And I'll tell you, some days I can feel the need for this because if I don't, I know, if I don't do this, the day is not going to go well for me. I'm going to be distracted. I'm going to get off. I'm going to, it's, it's not going to go well for me. But I had to discipline myself to do this. Now, now I do it without thought. All right, Christy, what time do we need to leave? 8.15. Okay, so, okay, I need to get up about quarter to seven. 
boom, 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 done. Okay. That that's just the way that it works. Discipline yourself to be in the Word. In the Word. Now I, I encourage people be in the Word in two ways. One, read it, so you can know it. Be familiar with it. Get in and read. Start in Genesis and read all the way through. Get a reading plan that takes you through the Bible in a year. Or, or if you're a slow reader, they have Bible plans that will take you through the Bible in two years. Do that. But read it. Read all of it. Don't do like I did for years and years and years. I only read the parts I liked. Jeremiah was out. I, I didn't like Jeremiah. Some of those little prophet guys, they were out. I stuck with the ones that I liked. That's why it's so important to get a plan. Be disciplined. Stay with the plan. That's the first way we read it. Being familiar with it. Knowing it. The second way is study it. Don't just let your eyes roam over the pages. Study it. When you come across something, you go, oh, wait a minute. I read that in another book. Go back and look at it. Get yourself a good Greek and Hebrew dictionary. Study what the words mean. Because English is a horrible language. It, it's horrible. It does not convey ideas very well. And then you've got to add in all those commas and semicolons and colons and, and stuff. It doesn't convey things nearly as well as the languages that God chose to write his word to us in. Okay? So get a dictionary. Start digging into the word. I'll tell you what. When I do a Bible study, when I'm studying the word, I break it down. First thing I do, I read through and I write down the questions. Well, what does this mean? Who is he talking to? Why is he saying this? I write those questions. And I read through and as I'm reading, I just jot a bunch of notes. Then I go back and I read and I start asking those questions. I start trying to find answers for them. Now, if you've been in the brothers meeting... If you were here a couple years ago when we did Colossians, you know how detailed I can be in that. I have yet to find that I can be so detailed that I can't learn more. And God, and God's bigger than me. His brain is much bigger than mine. There are so many things in his word that I still have yet to, to, to grab a hold of. Okay? So study the word. Make a discipline of it. Make a point every day to be in his word. Learn to shut up. That's a discipline. Trust me. Learn to be still and know that he is God. Discipline yourself to take some time and be quiet. Be quiet. We don't like silences. We want something to fill the dead space. Learn to be quiet, to hear what he would say to you, to hear what he would prompt you. Self-control. Start exerting self-control, not just in restraint, not just in holding back from what you shouldn't do, but embracing, engaging in what you should do. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures. Acts 24, 25, don't turn there. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read through quite a few scriptures here. Uh, if you need my notes afterward, come talk to me. I can get you the passages. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. This is Paul writing. He's in prison. Felix calls him. He wants to talk to him. He's hoping that Paul will offer him a bribe. Paul offers him the truth. And Felix is alarmed. Do you hear what he said there? He said, uh, and as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed. Now, I wonder, which of these made Felix alarmed? Was it the coming judgment? Or the fact that he should exhibit self-control and be righteous? You know, Felix, did, no, you know what? Go, leave, depart. Let me ponder this. 2 Peter chapter 1. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. 
virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch the last part of what he said there? Let me read this to you again. Just this last part. He, he lists these things that we should be exhibiting. This is another list of the fruit of the Spirit. All right? So, these things, and he says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to know Jesus, you've got to be increasing in this fruit. You've got to have His Spirit in you to reveal truth to you. Knowing Jesus is something that is spiritually discerned. Without God's Spirit, you can't get it. You won't understand it. It will be nonsense to you. Without God's Spirit, this is useless to you. Because you can't get it. Okay? It won't sink in. You might understand the words. You could probably quote more of it back to me than I could. But without God's Spirit, all it is is words on a page. Fantastic words. They can teach you a good moral life. But without God's Spirit, what good has it done you? Having God's Spirit, birthing these fruits in your life, makes this alive and real. If you read this and you go, yeah, I just don't get it. I, I, I don't want to study this. I don't want to read this. It's boring. Boring? <clears throat> boring. Think about this for a moment. The greatest love of your life wrote you a love letter explaining who they were and how much they loved you and the willingness that they were to go to great lengths to demonstrate that love for you, up to and including giving up their life for you. How often would you read that letter? You think maybe more than once? Or do you think you'd read it and go, yeah, I don't get it. This is boring. Because that's what this is. This is God revealing himself to us and stating in as clear and plain language as can be done how much he loves us, how desperate he is for a relationship with us, how much he longs to make your life better. <coughs> and he's the one that created you. I think you might have an idea how it's supposed to work. So in increasing measure. <clears throat> now there are two proverbs I want to give you. Because one of them talks about a lack of self-control. And one of them talks about the advantage of self-control. So Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28 says, A man without self-control is like a city broken and left without walls. Now, we, we don't really fully appreciate what this means because this was written in a time when cities were fortified. Okay, In our age of enlightenment, we don't have people marching through our cities and conquering things. Well, at least not here. But a man without self-control is defenseless. He cannot even guard himself. He can't even guard himself. Well, now we're going to look at the other side of this. Proverbs 16, verse 32, says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. You get that? It's, it's almost the reverse. If you can control yourself, man, you're better than somebody that took that city. I've made a habit of reading a, a proverb a day. I read whatever chapter the day is. And over and over and over again, I see in in Scripture, in Proverbs, 
how foolish it is to allow anger to control you. Do you know that when you read in Proverbs and it says fool, that the Hebrew word there is, is really meaning somebody without a moral compass, somebody that's inclined to evil, that, that's, that's what they're talking about as a fool. And it says that, that a fool gives full vent to his anger. <clears throat> oh, that made me pause and look. Full vent to, have you ever been there at that point where you're at the cusp and you know, you know what? I'm going in. <laughs> Casting off all restraint and I'm diving in. Everybody's going to know how angry I am. War fool me, war fool you. Better to be self-controlled. Better to show restraint. I have an example that I want to share with you because who is, who is our example? Jesus. Jesus. Matthew chapter 5. This is... Uh, the Sermon on the Mount. You can go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 43. <clears throat> now this is what Jesus is telling us. Okay? He says... You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. We've heard that said, right? But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow. Okay. So love your brother, love my enemy? Love Boko Haram? Love Al-Qaeda? Love ISIS? How do I do that? God, do you see what they're doing? He, well, yeah. He sees everything. As a matter of fact, he saw what they were doing today, 2,000 years ago, and he still sent his son to the cross to die for their sins. Thank God for that, because if he didn't send them to die for their sins, he wouldn't have died for yours. See, that's why scripture says that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Because when Christ went to the cross, all sin, from Adam and Eve on, till that last judgment, all sin was paid for on the cross. Every single one. Everything you've done, everything you're doing, everything you will do has been paid for. The sins that you see on TV that Boko Haram and ISIS are committing has been paid for. Christ went to the cross that they might have a chance that we might have a chance. The sin in your life separates you as far from God as the sins they're committing. Don't get your nose up in the air and say, well, at least I'm not like that. Because Jesus also addressed that. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And they went into the temple. And oh, we're so like the Pharisees. Thank God! I am not like them! I'm righteous and holy. And I've got my nose up in the air. So I can look down on everyone. But we should be like the tax collector. 
who didn't even look up to heaven, but he put his head down and beat his breast. God, forgive me. Because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Which of them was proved righteous? Because that Pharisee will stand before God in his self-righteousness and say, yeah. I had the law. I had the prophets. I had it all together. And God will say, but you didn't believe. But I did all these things. Man, I, I prophesied in your name. I did great things in your name. And he's going to say, I, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart. But to those who come and say, I have no right to stand before you, but your son has paid my price. He has paid my price. My body, my life is sealed unto you by his blood. We have an intercessor who says, no, this one is mine. This one is mine. He's marked. That's mine. Now, if Jesus could look down at you in your sin and say, yes, I want that one. What makes you think he doesn't look down on them in their sin and not want them? His desire, God's heart, is that all would be saved. Everyone. Fully understanding, knowing everything that some people will reject him. They will choose not they will say, no, I don't want it. I don't need it. God, I don't, need, I don't need you. I've got this all figured out. I don't need this. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. I started in verse 6. I'll start again. Chapter 5, verse 6. <clears throat> Romans 5, starting in verse 6. For while we were still weak, and at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled by God to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, there's, there's two things I want to point out to you. And they're both kind of, they play on the same thing. One, Christ came and died while we were still sinners. Okay? You understand that, right? He died while we were still sinners. Do you understand what being a sinner makes you? It makes you an enemy of God. God looks at you as his foe. And yet, God determined to, to, to die on our behalf so we could have life while we were still his enemy. While we were still opposed to him. While we were still working against him, he chose to do this. <clears throat> See, God doesn't ask of you anything that he has not already done. Hebrews tells us that Jesus has already suffered every temptation known to man. Because we suffer temptation, he came and suffered temptation and proved himself victorious. So when he says, love your enemies, he's not asking you to do something he hasn't already done because he loved you. 
And He still loves you. And He's still calling out for those that don't know Him. I love you. I want relationship with you. I want to be restored relationship. I want to be reconciled. You have offended me, but I'm making a way to reconcile. That's why it's so important when Paul writes in Corinthians, we are ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. We've received it. We've got to share it so that others can receive it. That's the way God designed it to work. You receive it and you give it. Oh, people don't want to hear, you know, my story. Yeah, you're right. They probably don't. But they desperately need to hear what God has done for you. How can you shut your mouth in the face of that? Can you really say that you love them if you won't share your testimony with them? I mean, that's, that's how we know what love is, because he loved us. That's the only way we can love them. That's the only way we can pour into them. Self-control. Not just restraining yourself from doing what you shouldn't. But disciplining yourself to do those things you should. To fulfilling the things that God has laid before you to do. To sharing with others. To engaging. To being knitted into the body of Christ. To belonging, to pressing on, pressing into Him, trusting Him, having faith that what He said He will do, He will do. Having faith that what He said He's done is done. Having peace so that you can fall asleep in the midst of the storm. And rest, knowing that nothing is going to happen to you but what God has allowed. And His plans for you are good. His heart toward you is good. Father, we bless you. We thank you, God, that you have given to us of your spirit to enable us, to empower us to do these things that you have called of us. Father, that these these fruits of your spirit are birthed in us by your spirit living in us. That God, we have to work cooperatively. We have to choose which we will show, the works of our flesh or the fruit of your spirit. Father, you have said in your word that when we come to you, we crucify our flesh. We now have a choice. We can choose to exhibit the fruit of your spirit. We can choose to show love. We can choose to have peace. We can choose to dwell continually in your joy. To be self-controlled, to discipline ourselves. To do those things you have laid before us to do. Not unto salvation, but because we are saved. Because we have felt your love for us. Open our eyes today, Father, that we might see you. Open our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we might receive. Help us, Father, to see how we truly are before you. Having received of your Spirit, Father, we stand as your very righteousness. Father, without your spirit, we're your enemies. Our very lives stand in opposition to you. I ask, Father, that you would open our eyes right now to see the truth, to know the truth. Guard our hearts and our minds in you, Father.
Shelter us in the shadow of your wing. Be our high tower, our fortress, our refuge. The place where we take shelter. Help us, Father, to be firmly established in <coughs> the sure, unshakable, unmovable foundation that is your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, that we would not look as this world. Father, we would not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. God, transform our minds. Renew them so that we can know your will. Speak to us as only you can, Father. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus.